If you paid attention even a little bit in school, then you probably know that the Battle of Bull Run kicked off the American Civil War. And you might even know that this is where the indomitable Stonewall Jackson got his name. Yes, the saying goes, form, form, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. But what they didn't teach in school was that at this epic battle, there were women in the thick of the fight standing right next to the men. Women like Clara Barton, Annie Etheridge, or Katie Brownell were not merely supporting, but also rallying soldiers, carrying the flag and bearing arms next to their fellow fighters on this bloody American battlefield. These women broke social norms and ran towards the danger that most today can barely imagine. They were the women of Bull Run. Talk with History. I'm your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights to our history-inspired world travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Now, before we get into our main topic, I want to ask our listeners for reviews on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're listening. The reviews really do help the show grow. And now that we're trying to put this out as a video podcast, sharing the video wouldn't hurt either. So YouTube share would be great because I bet the History Channel does not do live streams like this. <laughs> I bet we they do. We are coming for them, <laughs> as we tell you guys all the time. Jen, why don't you get us started on our topic tonight, which is the first Battle of Bull Run and what we did there. Sure. So... This is Women's History Month, and the first battle of Bull Run is very talked about. Yeah. I would say if you're a Civil War historian buff or just like to study the Civil War, first battle of Bull Run is a very significant battle. I wouldn't say maybe not as popular as Gettysburg, but pretty popular. It's a, it's a popular one. It's the first significant battle of the Civil War. It's the one that really sets the stage for this being a drawn out civil war. Yep. This is not going to be an easy victory for either side. You mentioned that we've we've actually talked about Bull Run once mm -hmm. or twice mm -hmm. over the over this past month. Yes. Largely because of Rose Greenhow. Because of Rose Greenhow. Who was a Confederate spy. Yeah. So that is why we did Bull Run is Rose Greenhow's story kind of led us there. And since it had been done so often, and since it was Women's History Month, we decided to do Bull Run in a women-centered lens. Right. So we wanted to talk about the women at Bull Run. And we, we kind of talk about women in the Civil War as well. Which I thought was actually quite fascinating, looking at it through through the lens of the women that were at Bull Run because some of the women that were there, you, you told their stories, right? Yes. So we told the larger, the, the story that everybody who's who's kind of a, a little bit of a history fan understands the Battle of Bull Run, right? Yeah. So the overall kind of what was happening, people didn't think that this was going to be a big deal, but then you kind of told women's stories yes. in between. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Well, and what I wanted people to understand is it's just so multifaceted, right? Women are not just operating in one element of the war, right? They're not just nurses or right. they're not just wives of soldiers. Like they're doing everything, in warfare. And so I wanted to tell their stories and just give them credit for what's happening. Plus, Bull Run is significant because the first casualty of the Civil War is a woman. Yep. And so, and she's still buried there at Bull Run. She's buried on the battlefield. So there's a lot of women stories we could tell. And I think it's important because we do get a lot of like significant figures that come out of the Civil War. Clara Barton, significant, but she gets her start at the first battle of Bull Run. Right. So it's kind of interesting to, to, to tell the stories of how these women are all coming together and doing their part in the Civil War, even in the very first battle. One of the things that I enjoy is those battlefields that give you a feel like you're there. Oh, yeah. And this is absolutely one of those battlefields that really gives you the feel for, oh, yeah, I can ab I can totally see how this was because they have the a statue of Stonewall Jackson, which is obviously larger larger than life. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of standing there on this one rise with cannons on one, on one side. And then there's the house that you talk about yes. where the first casualty was mm -hmm. with cannons on the other side. And there's this large battlefield in between. You're like, man, this is like, 
they would just walk straight across in lines and they would fire at each other. It's just, I mean, just wild how they how they did it back then for us now. And this is one of those battlefields. It wasn't massive, not compared to Yorktown or, or the battlefield and things like that. But the, the battlefield itself, I think, was just, I, I love that open feel and it really gives you the the picture of what it was like sure it was it's beautiful it's run by the national park service i definitely recommend visiting it it does have a statue of stonewall jackson we'll talk about him so you'll have two battles a bull run right the first battle bull run and sometimes say the battle of manassas you'll hear both they're kind of used interchangeably um and I, I use Bull Run for the first one and Manassas for the second one. You can use Manassas for the first one, Bull Run for the second one. But what we did that was significant, and I want people to realize is how close the proximity was to Washington, D.C. Yeah. So when we visited that battlefield, we drove from Washington, D.C. And it's a 30-minute drive. It's right outside of the city. And this is significant because if you think about the Civil War and this being the first significant battle of the Civil War, how close they are to Washington, D.C., So this plays into the whole atmosphere at the time because there was an article that came out in the Union that said, march on to Richmond. And they just figured they're going to take their army, the Union is going to take their army and just march on to Richmond. And Richmond at the time is, of course, the capital of the Confederacy. Well, this motivates the Confederacy to stop their march to Richmond and Bull Run, Manassas, the significance of that area is the railroad line that leads into Richmond, which is giving supplies to Richmond, to the Confederacy. So that's why they want to defend this area. So they were they were really almost there to protect their their supply line. Their supply right? line. Which was the railroad. And this is also going to significantly help the Confederacy because this is how they get their troops there quickly, is through that railroad line. They let they get troops onto cars and able to get them to Manassas Bull Run to fight in the battle. And, and one of the things that we touched on once or twice actually in the video was because it was so close to DC, the kind of the, the DC elite yes. actually came out in like picnic style picnic. To, to watch this battle. So this first battle Bull Run is known as the picnic battle because you do get these elites, these congressmen, these senators who are bringing their families and their buggies and their picnic blankets and their baskets and their setting out to watch the battle i don't think people are understanding what is is going to happen here of course they don't they don't see the significance i was reading before we started this of how many soldiers from west point went to the confederacy and it's about 290 went to the confederacy and you're going to get the superintendent of the of west point is beauregard and he's leading the confederacy at bull run so What you're seeing right now is such a split of the nation. And you're going to get Lee, who very prestigious in the army, is going to go to the Confederacy. Beauregard, he's he's the superintendent of West Point, going to the Confederacy. And you're going to get these soldiers. Now, I had said in the video, like, you're going to get people who have political appointments or buying their commissions. But people are not buying their commissions and what I think people alluded to, like they're paying for their commissions. And I I didn't mean it that way. Buying their commissions politically. Like I'm a senator. I should be a general. I'm a senator. I should be a colonel. So it's like buying them in a political sense. Now, you do get people who actually buy their commissions more in the south maybe than in the north like nathan bedford Forrest, for example sure who has all that money he's able to become an officer because he's able to kind of pay for a lot of things but in the north side it's more political appointments and that is what really hurts the union here because in this first battle they're not ready they don't know how to fight they don't know how to line up an infantry they don't understand tactics they don't they can't they don't take orders well and the yeah. retreat is just a mess So what's happening is with Claire Barton, so I would talk about the most significant Red Cross nurse to come out of this battle, is she's very she plays an influential part in that retreat. Yeah. So as the Union is retreating and you have injuries, 5,000 casualties during this first battle, and the retreat is just a mess. The walking wounded is where we first start to see this. They're walking back into D.C. They don't want to stay 
in Manassas because they don't want to die because there's nobody there to get them. There's no ambulances, there's no wagons, all that has left during the battle. And so these walking wounded come back into DC. She first encounters them. She sits with them. She's writing letters with them. She's feeding them. And then she's about six days later, they realize there's still people out there. And they go back towards Manassas and find all these casualties, these people still alive or in makeshift shacks and stuff. And that's when she starts to realize we need more provisions. Remind me, so for Clara Barton, right, for someone Mm -hmm. who doesn't know kind of how significant she was, did she kind of help found basically the earliest versions of the Red Cross? Yeah, she's the founder of the Red Cross. Okay. All right. So that's, I mean, that's one thing, like, I I know we didn't go into the video because I did put that in the video (laughs) because I'm the the editor. Yeah. We talk about women in in almost every facet here. We talk about women spies. Rose Greenhow. Rose Greenhow is seducing Brigadier General McDowell. He is the, he's the head of the Union Army. She is working for the Confederacy. She lives in D.C. And she's a, a Southern woman of you know, of means. So she's able to wine and dine elite men. And she finds out how many troops they're sending. Yeah, he basically gives her troop movements and numbers. Because she's a woman and she thinks he thinks she's dumb. She's able to get that number to Beauregard. And when Beauregard knows they're bringing upwards of 30,000 troops, he is able, he only has a cup like 10,000, a little bit over 10,000 that first initially meet the Union, but he's able to get 20,000 there to eventually push back the Union and it becomes a Confederacy win. So here you get Rose Greenhow. Beauregard gives her credit. He says, because of her, we were able to know how many men were coming and get the men there to fight. So he gives her a lot of credit. So we have her. And and one of the interesting things is to, I mean, even now, just as, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, the battlefield's big, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, Manassas is a decent size. But for 30,000 people, let's say, on each side. Yeah, no, it was, yes, 29,000 Union, 32,000 Confederacy. So think about it. So 60,000 60, people on this battlefield. Now that I sit here and think about it, that's a boatload of people <laughs> i'm trying not to cuss on the live stream but that's that's a ton of people on this battlefield i i can't i honestly can't imagine seeing sixty thousand people on the field where we were and one of the things i, I like about again going to places like this is you kind of get that broad expansive kind of view from a, a camera perspective i like doing things like that but sixty thousand people on this battlefield i mean they must have literally been stepping over e- each other and the dead as they're trying to continue the fight on this battlefield sure and another thing that's significant about bull run most historians will know or people who just like to study this is are the uniforms haven't been decided yet that's right this is not a blue versus gray yet right so everyone's kind of wearing their uniform and because they haven't really separated you don't know who's friendly and who's not and people haven't really distinguished like well we're confederacy we're union they did have battle flags but when the battle flags were draped and not full flared like with the wind they look the same oh really and that's why the union will eventually change i mean the confederacy will eventually change their flag but when they're draped you can't tell whose flag is who so it, it, it becomes this mass chaos. And that's another thing with the retreat from the Union is because they, they don't even know what they're doing. They can't see. They can't tell who they're fighting. And, <laughs> and even to, to kind of go back to some of the women that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Now, not all of them were there necessarily in a support role. I mean, some of them were there actually like fighting right alongside the men. I, mean, I think you said there were over 400 women that were on the battlefield helping and helping or fighting in some form or fashion. So at the time, you have a Mary Livermore who is working for the Sanitation Commission, and she estimates this 400 women who are fighting in as men in the war. But nowadays, historians think it's upwards of a thousand. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Women who actually wore the uniform as a male and dressed as a male. Just got out there to go fight. Mm -hmm. And one of them significant is from the first battle bull run. And I don't think we talk about her in the video. No, but, you um, you talked. To, I think I think this is the one you talked yeah. about. By and I ended up cutting Sarah Emma Edmonds. Sorry, got to get those e's out. Changes her name to Frank Thompson, mm-hmm. and she fights under the Second Michigan Infantry Company F. 
Yeah, and I think one of our commenters, one of our subscribers, Rick, mm-hmm. actually actually brought her up and said, "Hey, what about her?" And and yeah. I actually rep- replied and said, "Actually, Jen did talk about her yes. in one of the video clips. It just didn't make the the video editor's cut, which yes. happens every now and then. Which is another reason why we like to do these podcasts and live streams, so we get to tell you guys a little bit more in detail some of the things that didn't make the the twelve minute video. So she's a significant, interesting story. She is a male oh. for part of the war." and then is captured and then frank thompson is labeled a deserter so she doesn't want to come back in as a deserter so she comes back in as a woman yeah. and, and and nurses for the rest of the war but she's the second woman woman to be recognized by the gar so we'll talk about the first woman to be recognized by the gar so that's the grand army of the republic she's gets to wear the star and gets a pension but you do have women who who dresses males and keep that identity their entire lives. And so that is Jenny Hodgers. She's the 95th Illinois company G she's in 40 battles of the civil war. She uses the name Albert cash cashier. And she was a man before the battle. She assumes the identity of a man before the battle. And she maintains the identity of a man, even in up until her death. And her, she claims that she wanted the excitement and she wanted to be a part of the battle. Some people claim she might have been the first, or claim, label her as a trans man sure. because she wanted to. She kept the identity even yeah. outside of warfare. So you have women who are pretending to be men, dressing as men, but then you have women who are women who are wearing a dress yep. and they're just I'm a woman fighter and the most significant of that is Katie Bromwell and she was there at the first battle of Bull Run. She. Um, she enlists with her husband. And we talk about this. Yeah, we did. And it's so funny because her husband, de- de- he's a deserter. <laughs> and I don't really need to laugh in the video, but like she doesn't. And she's in the Rhode Island Regiment. She's injured and she helps. She's she's designated to cu- to hold the colors. I say that she might have picked up the colors from someone who had dropped them, but she's actually designated to hold the colors. And and we've we've talked about kind of the significance of, of that before. Mm-hmm. And kind of what that means, because really in those battles back then, the colors were important, not just to, as like a motivating factor, but also to show where the line was. It's so significant in infantry warfare, because at the time when you don't know uniforms, at least we know our banner. And if we can fight alongside our banner, we know our line. And that's why she's so significant. So. She holds the banner high, even with Confederacy bullets flying by. She is awarded, again, she's discharged from the Union Army. She gets a pension. She wears a star. And she's just significant throughout the Civil War. She stays in until she's injured, I think, in 1863. But she's the first woman to receive um, the GAR star. Now we talk a little bit about Annie Etheridge we talk about in the video. She is from the 2nd and 3rd Michigan, 5th Regiment. She's a medic. And so she's participating as a supporter as well because there are women that will follow their men and they cook for them, right? There's nothing for them at back home. Yeah, they're, they're following yeah. in the support role. Yeah, unless you had a homestead and land if your man is going to fight, you go with them. And so you fix uniforms, you, you, you nurse them if they get sick, yeah. you make food and you're kind of following behind in kind of like the camp setting. And that's what Anne Etheridge does. And she's a medic the whole time. And the other person we talk about which is the casualties, the women casualties at this time. And that is Judith Henry. She's the 84-year-old mm-hmm. who's in the house at the top of the hill of Bull Run. That's her home. And the, the Confederacy comes into her home, goes into the attic as sharpshooters. And her family tries to get her out of the house, tries to put her on a mattress because she's bedridden and tries to get her out. But can you imagine trying to get her out of the house when you see our video in the middle of a battlefield? <laughs> With sixty thousand yeah. people, uh, yeah, as there's like cannons going by, there's 80, people having eighty-four a year old over women, there. and yeah. you're trying to carry. So they take her back to the house, and at the time when the union realizes there's snipers, sharpshooters coming out of the attic, they just bombard the house with art- artillery. You yeah. see the cannons. And, and they lined actually, up. there's actually pictures that people went back to that battlefield after mm-hmm. the fact, and they took pictures of of basically the remains of that house, Which and is it's literally the like frame. the chimney 
in a part of the frame. Yeah. yeah. So she's a casualty. Yeah. She's the first casualty. Happens to be a woman, 84 years old, buried in the front yard. And so that, when if you go to Bull Run, her grave is there. Her homestead is there. Rebuilt. And then you have the the statue of Stonewall Jackson. So I say the significant things that are coming out of this battle, that name and the motivation and the morale for the Confederacy is the biggest thing that's going to come out of this. And I'm not going to lie, like the statue is pretty cool looking. It is. I, I mean, think he, cooler than Jackson he, ever really looked. Oh, yeah. No, he, he looks like Superman up there. <laughs> this is not a, a man of, of normal proportions that they put on this horse on this pedestal in yeah. the middle of the battlefield. Like he, he looks like he's in a, wearing a superhero outfit, but it, it really does it gives you that that kind of whole concept of Stonewall Jackson, right? What, what's the what's the quote? Form, form, form. form on, yeah, on, form up behind on uh, Jackson standing there like a stone wall, standing there like a stone wall. Um, mm-hmm. And it really does give you that feel because he's up on this rise and out on the battlefield. There are you know, the cannons that are lined up off to the side, not mm-hmm. too far from him. And if you were a soldier and you saw your general, you know, sitting on a sitting on a horse, just kind of sitting there, being like, "Yeah, this we're good, we mm-hmm. got this," and you're just sitting out in front, you'd probably be pretty motivated too. Yeah, and I it worked in their favor, yeah. right? Because I say in the video, I don't know if it's smart or dumb, yeah, because you are a standing target. If you're not moving, it makes it very easy for someone to aim at you. Uh, but what you have happening at this time is when the Confederacy reinforcements are coming yeah. and so the union is getting tired they're not understanding what's happening they're retreating and the confederacy is just bombarding them with more and more fresh men and stonewall jackson stands there he's injured in the hand so you can see he wraps his hand he puts his hand on his waist and he stays on his horse and even though his brigade loses 50 percent of their men which is the high one of the highest casualties there they stand there and they're able to reinforce people and because the confederacy wins the morale that comes out of that for the confederacy is what really drives and builds the rest of the civil war for it, them it's a massive turning point for the south i mean mm-hmm. even the pictures that i pull up of stonewall jackson it it's him like going through town and shaking the hand of a little boy. This is after the battle yeah. because he is now a inst- instantly a, a, mm-hmm. a hero, a hero, right? Mm-hmm. He, the, the myth was created right then and there. Mm-hmm. And like I say, most people probably don't even know his first name is Thomas. Right. Because I didn't, know, I didn't know that. <laughs> but so what's happening to women at this time? So what happens to the significance of Stonewall Jackson is union women are basically like gut punched, Right. They're like, how could our men retreat? They're very melancholy. They're very they're, the wind has been taken out of their sails. They hear the opposite. Right. They hear the union has retreated. They hear this is not going to be an easy battle. Look how close they are to Washington, D.C. And they won this battle. And so they feel very demoralized. Now, their men have retreated. Their men are injured. Now, President Lincoln has to get more men. He has to train more men. We have to designate new uniforms. And so the Union women feel like the wind has been taken out of their sails. And then you got um, the Southern women who feel you know, rep- like repurposed. Sure, they yeah. feel proud. Oh, of course. And Everybody s- wants to, their home team to win. Yeah. So this is what you're seeing with the women on either side that is happening out of this battle. So if you paid attention even a little bit in school, then you probably know that the Battle of Bull Run, as we talked about, kicked off the American Civil War. And you might even know that this is where the indomitable Stonewall Jackson got his name. Yes, the saying goes, form, form, there stands stands Jackson like a stone wall. But what they didn't teach in school was that at this epic battle, there were women in the thick of the fight standing right next to the men. Women like Clara Barton, Annie Etheridge, or Katie Brownell were not merely supporting, but also rallying soldiers, carrying the flag and bearing arms next to their fellow fighters on this bloody American battlefield. These women broke social norms or ran towards the danger that most today can barely imagine. They were the women of Bull Run. 
So thank you for listening to the Talk With History podcast. And please reach out to us at our website, talkwithhistory.com. But more importantly, if you know someone else that might enjoy this, share the video, share the live stream or the podcast. Shoot them a text and tell them to look us up. Because we rely on you, our community, to grow. And we appreciate you all every day. Talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you.